Wonderful. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, evening, um, other time of the day for those of you uh, tuning in from uh, from Asia. Uh, my name is Anna Tunkel. I'm the head of strategic initiatives and global partnerships at APCO Worldwide, one of world's leading uh, advisory, advocacy and communications firms uh, with offices and teams in more than 40 markets. And I'm delighted to welcome you to today's session on impact multiplying partnerships. We live in a complex world, and so from global pandemics to trade tensions to increasingly challenging nature of globalization shaped by technology breakthroughs and innovations, globally societal expectations on the role of business have profoundly changed. Today, business leaders, um, and not just business leaders, need to have not only a compass and a radar to navigate these changing realities, but also a smart approach to mobilize like-minded and often less traditional partners for action and collaboration. In this day and age, a company, a sector, an organization cannot tackle alone the challenges that we all face. And the most successful and progressive leaders have built an ecosystem of innovative partners, companies, multilateral agencies, NGOs, academic networks, um, startups, disruptors, and innovators. APCO's global platforms uh, and partnerships team is focused on building and activating a unique ecosystem and network of innovative organizations that work um, at the forefront of critical issues on the global agenda today. Upskilling and reskilling, climate action and circular economy, economic prosperity, equality, equity, justice and diversity and more. And some of the more interesting work is focused on bringing to the table partners who would not have thought they had anything in common. And so I'm delighted to chair this panel and welcome this fantastic group of panelism, panelists that uh, really are a microcosm um, in who you represent of this multi-stakeholder community that we need to tackle today's intractable challenges. We have Marcy Lin, uh, Director of Social Impact Partnerships at Facebook. Um, Marcy leads a team that develops programs and partnerships that seek to leverage the full range of Facebook's assets um, to create positive social impact. And prior to her work at Facebook, she was with Oracle, Sun Microsystems, and uh, Health Position with leading um, consulting firms. Courtney O'Donnell uh, has driven social impact through global public affairs and partnership development in senior roles in the White House, at nonprofit organizations, national political campaigns, and in the private sector. And most recently, she served as director of global partnerships at Airbnb, where she established alliances to encourage sustainable tourism, support economic development, and promote female entrepreneurship around the world. We have Greg Watson, uh, an advisor at the Natural Capital Lab, Climate Change and Sustainable Development Sector at the Inter-American Development Bank. Greg works with IDB Group and partners to drive innovation in natural capital finance and promote biodiversity mainstreaming. He helps incubate, accelerate and scale new solutions to pressing environmental problems by looking at nature as an asset. And last but not least, uh, we have Vijay Rajendran, uh, Head of Global Corporate Growth at 500 Startups, where he's advising global companies, coaching startups, and developing new markets and ecosystems to create innovative products and services, especially in those industries divided by digital. So, uh, in setting up this scene, each of you are leading truly innovative collaborations between your organization and a full universe of external stakeholders often doing exactly what I said in the beginning, bringing to the table uh, organizations that would have not thought that they had anything in common. Um, so describe your work and perhaps an example of a partnership that can bring to life uh, something that you're particularly proud of. Um, so Courtney, uh, let's start with you. Uh, and you're on mute. Uh, so uh, the, most, the most frequent phrase of this past Rule one of the <laughs> virtual conferences, unmute oneself. Um, thank you so much, Anna. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, really wonderful to be here um, talking and learning about a topic that's so relevant with um, all these wonderful um, panelists. Um, so in my role at Airbnb, I think um, I, I sort of straddle a lot of the pieces that you, you spoke about working with different stakeholders that are relevant <clears throat> to tourism and hospitality um, and, and trying to ensure that we are driving Airbnb's mission of um, belonging across um, the world through our platform and looking at, you know, all, what all of those different stakeholders are most importantly. Um, and, and one of the areas I've focused is in the communities in which um, we are present. And so I think uh, there it's hard to pick a partnership that's um, a favorite because it's like picking a favorite child. But I um, we one of the programs I've had the chance to work on in my um, years at Airbnb is called the Airbnb Academy. Um, and that is the way that we we look at all of the economic benefits and um really the opportunity that tourism brings and try to ensure that it reaches 
the entire community and not just uh, specific segments. What's so great about academies is that we work really closely with um, ministries of tourism, with destination marketing organizations from the local community, but also um, with local NGOs um, and um, really try to to bring tourism into regions that wouldn't necessarily see it otherwise, but also to people who really are ambassadors of um, their local communities. And so um, one of the first places that we tried this was in rural India, working with the Self-Employed Women's Association, um, which is an incredible organization that represents um, it's a women, um, many of which live in rural regions and um, so being able to co-create the program with SEWA um, in a way that is sustainable, also working with um, tourism ministries to bring, um, to achieve some of India's tourism goals to really bring um, tourism and visitors into um, different parts of the country, um, you know, has really been a, an incredible opportunity. And from there, um, we were able to to build upon the program and bring it to other regions, which, um, you know, w with a lot of those learnings. So I could go on for a long time about Sewa and, the, and, and what we've learned there. But um, I think that gives just a little glimmer because um, just last week we, we announced we're moving the academy to the U.S., um, working with, um, starting in North Carolina, working with um, both Native American populations and um, the North Carolina different destination marketing organizations sort of building upon those um, some of the pieces that we've learned in Africa and Asia. So um, a really exciting um, partnership there that I think involves the, the multi-stakeholder approach. Fantastic. And, and we'll come back actually to this point of finding the common ground and alignment. But Greg, um, going to you, um, describe the work that you lead at the at the Capital Lab and how does this sort of building broader ecosystem of partners comes to life through through that? Sure. So I work at the Inter-American Development Bank, which is a multilateral organization. Um, you know, our owners are the various different countries that are donors and recipients of our fund. But I work on topics of climate change and sustainability. And if you're really going to be looking at those topics, you need to be looking at public-private partnerships and, and ways that we can bring all of these uh, various disparate actors together. But at the same time, I'd say the biggest piece of my job is making different value cases that resonate to different kinds of actors. Because I work with ministers of finance, ministers of environment, but also with um, large engineering firms, infrastructure firms, ministries of tourism. I mean, you can go down the different sectors all the way down to local communities and, you know, indigenous populations. And, you know, climate change impacts all of those different actors differently. And I work specifically on biodiversity and natural capital. And, you know, nature as an asset for each of those actors also um, could be either an input, could be something that they're having an impact on, it could be a cultural asset. And, I think what the most important piece is, is actually for me, kind of serving as a Rosetta Stone that can bring all of those different actors together around a shared vision. And I'll give you one example that is something that we've recently funded through my program with money from the UK in Panama, where um, partners you never think would work together are working together. What, the overall goal of the project is to um, conserve and protect and restore mangrove ecosystems in, in Panama, in Panama City. Um, and, you know, mangroves can provide a whole host of benefits from, you know, storm protection, flood protection. They provide habitat for fish, which they provide, um, you know, carbon sequestration, a ton of benefits. But the partners in this project, what I love about it is it's executed by the Audubon Society because mangroves are really important flyway habitat for birds. The client is the Ministry of Environment, along with the Ministry of Fisheries and the um, municipality of Panama City. Um, and then the actors in the project are the airport because it's built on the coast and it needs the mangroves for protection. The water treatment plant because mangroves have an important filtration um, impact. The wealthy landholders who receive the benefit of, um, you know, the storm surge protection. Poorer coastal communities who also can be flooded, but also depend a lot on these resources for fish, fishing and for, you know, livelihoods. And then other coastal businesses like shrimp farms that also require the mangroves as a, you know, an ecosystem service. And all of those actors are working together, along with school children who are learning in schools about this, to pressure the government, one, 
to include mangroves in their national planning, but also to begin to think about how to develop sustainable financial mechanisms to support these mangroves. And so I love this example because you would never expect all of those groups to be working together around anything. And it also shows you how, you know, at least for me, nature links all sectors. That's fascinating. And I would love also to unpack, you know, potentially if we have time with all of you in terms of the, the mechanics of the how, because I think even bringing such complex group of multi-stakeholder communities uh, is an achievement in and of itself. Um, Marcy, uh, perhaps over to you and, um, and talk to us a little bit about how this theme and topic of, of partnerships comes to life through your work and, um, and sort of some of the great impact examples that, uh, that you're leading. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I lead our social impact partnerships team, which is really focused on working with nonprofits and the social sector more broadly to on their digital transformation. That's really how we think about it. Facebook's mission is to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. And it's that our team is really focused on the give people the power part of the mission. And our team is really focused on giving nonprofits and the social sector the power, whether that's through our um, our various tools on our family of apps, deep partnerships. Sometimes it involves investment in those partners. So a really good example of how this has come to life over the course of the past year has been this global pandemic. And Facebook as a platform that many people um, are on all the time using to get information, to share information, and really trying to, there were a few phases to how we responded to the pandemic with different partners, but as vaccines became available, but we were still in a world where not everyone had access to vaccines. So prevent behavior was still really important. We developed a few really um, strong, robust partnerships with global partners that also have local offices in various countries and worked with them across our various platforms to get the right information out to people at the right time. So depending on where they were in the world, um, the messaging was different. One partner we've been working with really closely on this is UNICEF um, and working on programs in like a hundred country offices related to both preventive health and addressing vaccine hesitancy and trying to connect people with access to vaccines. We've also been working closely with, you know, the WHO and the WHO Foundation, trying to help unlock um people's understanding and people power related to COVAX and how people, you know, COVAX is usually government funded, but how can we get people um, involved in advocating for governments to fund COVAX? So there are a lot of really strong partnerships just over the past year with these international NGOs that are, that also have local offices. And we've also been doing a program around capacity building as part of this digital transformation. So rather than having to connect with a hundred different UNICEF offices or a hundred different WHO offices, how can we build capacity by bringing all of them together? And then almost like train the trainer kind of model where we can train them and then they can perpetuate that learning down through and out through the organization. And it's been um, it's been inspiring. It's just been inspiring to watch. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but, you know, billions of people are accessing um, relevant content. We see brand lift on some of the information that people are getting out, which which is a way of telling us that the messages are getting through. And we'll get to the point of measurement and impact, which I think is also crucial um, later on in our discussion. So last but not least, um, Vijay, you formally don't have a partnership in your title, but you lead corporate growth at 500 startups. And I think inherent in your role is this connectivity of these ecosystems of startups to, again, less traditional partners, perhaps. Um, tell us a bit more what 500 startups is. Maybe there are some people who don't know. Um, and uh, how does this fit in? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Anna. So 500 Startups is one of the most active venture capital firms in the world, and we're unique in that we have a very special mission. Our mission is to uplift people and economies through entrepreneurship. And when I, I say uh, active, uh, we have invested in uh, 77 different countries. We 
have uh, more than 2,500 portfolio uh, companies, uh, and we were often the first to go into uh, what were then considered uh, frontier markets and are now considered a like, part of uh, the global uh, tech scene. Uh, and so in my role, uh, I'm part of a unique team that we have called Ecosystems, where we partner with corporations, foundations, and governments that are seeking to uh, transform uh, the, the ecosystem around them in, in some way, shape, or form. That could be geographic. It could be uh, cross-border. Uh, and in that sense, 500 has uh, a history of partnerships and has, uh, has, has built it, uh, its presence in that way. Uh, so, for example, we partnered with the Knight Foundation, the Miami Development Authority uh, government, and also uh, Visa on the corporate side to create a unique hub four years ago before it came, became cool to be a startup or VC in Miami and it helped shape that, uh, that tech ecosystem. Uh, similarly, we partner with uh, a uh, agency in Singapore called Enterprise Singapore to bring the best startups to Singapore and the best Singaporean startups to places like Silicon Valley and connect with leading companies uh, and uh, investors when uh, they're here. So um, our work is inherently about uh, connecting uh, those different uh, nodes in, in the ecosystem. Fascinating. So, uh, you know, a broader trend that I've observed in my years of working in the space of building broader multi-stakeholder partnerships is that sometimes there is a, this dichotomy of partnerships um, living either in business development and business sort of arm of the an organization with others living at sort of the, the social impact space. And only few progressive organizations are really trying to bridge um, this gap. And I think, Vigi, what you just mentioned, touched a little bit on this. Um, and so I'm curious, um, and perhaps, Marcy, more, more to you and, and, and to Courtney, where does the partnership function sit um, in their organization? Is it a standalone unit cuts across? Is it a function of each business? Or is it a muscle that I think um, all, all of you employ very successfully in, in how you bring you know, together different actors um, to the table? So, Marcy, perhaps starting with you. Yeah. So, um, currently at Facebook, the partnerships function is a standalone function that sits on the business side. Um, you may have seen a recent announcement that will be changing probably around the end of the year where we're going to bring together our sales function and our partnerships function under one umbrella chief business officer which will be led by our current head of partnerships. So, but that said, a lot of teams, our policy team has partnerships that are run out of the policy team. And, you know, very, our marketing team has partnerships that are run out of marketing, communications, et cetera. So while there is a standalone partnerships function, partnerships is a muscle that is really lives on many teams and we work we have a phrase at facebook we call working cross-functionally it's probably not specific to facebook but <laughs> um and so we you know for example my team ha we have an initiative on our team called project 17 which is about accelerating impact on the sustainable development goals we work very closely with a number of other internal teams who have un relevant partners that they work with or partners that they manage across our policy team, our marketing teams, some comms teams, folks. Um, and then we try to come together as one Facebook when we go out to these partners or do different projects with these partners. And Courtney, is it different in Airbnb? Yeah, I was um, nodding uh, to a lot of what Marcy said. And I think um, as we've grown, I really think that the notion of muscle um, is very apropos because um, partnership, you know, is at the core of what so many different parts of the organization are constantly doing, whether it's partnering with our hosts, partnering with our guests, partnering with communities. And as Marcy said, um, almost every function has partners that are critical to um, better understanding each of these stakeholders, um, education, um, outreach, um, 
and and collaboration in so many ways. And so I think almost every um, department has some sort of partnership um, activity going on that's critical to, to delivering on their goals. But what we're seeing more as we think about sort of formalizing what stakeholder engagement means is that we look at um, some overarching themes and there's a lot of cross-functional work because um, while I have always sat in the policy team, the work that I'm doing on sustainability doesn't ex exist just in the world of policy. It's at the core of the business. It's the top of mind for travelers um, and hosts. And so how we really think about sustainability in the broadest sense um, and then partnerships become holistic across the organization is definitely Definitely, um, where we go on a practical matter that can be, um, you know, to be candid, it can be challenging because there could be multiple points of contact across the organization. So I think that's where when you talk about how do you really bring these things to life, it's not, you know, I'll be very honest that that's very much um, a learning journey um, and one that, you know, we're all committed to, but it's, um, you know, is, is one that's complex. Um, but the... Um, yeah, I'll leave. <laughs> I mean, look, and it's, it's so much more. It's an art and it's a science. And I'm, you know, in, in an ideal world, I would love to, you know, have more of a process to it. But I think we're in a learning journey. I think that journey also has been ex like really accelerated over the past couple of years. Um, Greg, I know you don't represent formally the partnerships department of IADB, but talk to us. I mean, is it is it a muscle within the organization? Is there a partnerships function, or is it spread across? So yes, there's an entire office of outreach and partnerships that actually reports to the president directly at the bank. And um, what their their role is to, you know, they, they not only deal with all the structuring of the partnerships, you know, the memory memorandums of understanding and all of that part, but they also in many cases serve as a first point of contact for external partners who want to work with the bank. Um, and then what they'll typically do is bring several of us from across the organization together into an initial meeting and figure out, you know, help the process flow. Basically, we're talking about process. They'll help to create that flow um, to the, you know, right connections throughout the organization. Um, and so they manage that at the corporate level and, and I think they do it really well. I work a lot with that team um, through the nature of my, my work. Um, and then there are people like me who are embedded within specific areas of the bank whose job is more, uh, I'd say, outward facing. Um, and, you know, I try to serve kind of as a point of first contact on my topic. And even if I can't directly support somebody, I know all of the other people in the different parts of the bank who may have a different product or, or a different way to engage. And I can broker those introductions. Um, and so it's kind of a two tiered approach. I won't say that I mean, we're all learning as we do. We're talking about, and I wouldn't say it always works perfectly, but I think it works pretty well. Um, and uh, I guess maybe uh, hmm. it's, it's a really interesting point in terms of the, the structure of itself, if it's centralized versus um, spread out. And I think, you know, much to, to, to be unpacked there. But perhaps, you know, Vijay would love your perspective on and, you know, something also for the rest of the group on finding that common denominator. Right. In terms of what matters most to you in building these collaborations with other organizations. Is it mission alignment? Um, is it inspiring and empowering employees? Is it creating new markets? I mean, I think in your case, probably for, for the startups, um, is it partners ability? And Marcy and I talked a little bit about this to extend your organization's knowledge, network, capacity, credibility on certain issues. So. Um, what are most important things in, as you build this really impressive uh, collaborations that each of you described, it, starting with you? Yeah, that's uh, that's important sort of lens, like what really matters and what's the common denominator. And, and I think we're drawn to uh, larger opportunities for, for, for impact. Uh, and that means you know, where we think there are, uh, just like when we're evaluating a, a startup opportunity, big markets, a lot of uh, participants potentially uh, that we can galvanize uh, the uh, the attention of uh, key decision makers and, uh, and stakeholders either in um, the public or private sector uh, because uh, we work with organizations like uh, Mitsubishi and, and, and Visa and, and Petronas and, uh, uh, and those are certainly like corporations with very, very specific um, a goal to build their next billion dollar business or, or invest in one. Uh, but uh, that's uh, also like matched by, I think, an ambition uh, on the side of uh, those responsible for economic development 
uh, to see their societies and uh, transformed and uh, new uh, opportunities for you know, future generations uh, and things of that nature. Uh, and so, you know, uh, the, if we're looking for that on the other side of the table, you know, I think there's uh, there's got to be that that impact um, uh, and, and that priority that's table stakes. I think on on a, uh, on a uh, another level, we need to find strategic intent because uh, sometimes this can be a sideshow or innovation theater or something like that. Uh, in which case, you know, we're we're not interested and, and it's uh, you know a waste of everyone's time. Uh, and then there's going to be a desire to collaborate to win. Uh, you know, there's obviously been a lot of language about um, competition and uh, either in the the trade sphere or uh, obviously in, in the corporate world. Uh, but increasing the future is about uh, collaboration and, and partnering uh, to win. So you know, we work closely with some major corporations and thinking about those that are successful. It's also um, the, the mindset uh, to, to do that. That's one of the most important criteria to, to see success ultimately. And Courtney and I think shared some more stories about the importance. I mean, some, sometimes uh, incorrectly, the, 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 those global agenda setting moments uh, being the driver of like need to launch something by Anga, uh, as opposed to <laughs> <laughs> looking and you all are nodding and, you know, we've lived through that in our respective organizations. But, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about sort of your perspective and, you know, as Courtney and sort of also looking maybe from some of the previous hats that you were on what is important, not just from an Airbnb standpoint, but, you know, your previous um, government roles. Sure. Well, I think across the board, I, um, I think we all have felt that um, pressure of uh, a pending deadline or milestone. Um, the UN General Assembly is certainly one. And then there are markers like Earth Day or International Women's Day. And um, I think on the one hand, they represent incredible opportunities to um, engage more audiences in, in really important causes and obviously reach key stakeholders, which we're all seeking to do on various fronts. Um, but I think one of my greatest learnings has been like some of the most valuable um, and meaningful partnerships for all involved um, sometimes start very slowly and the results are not ones that generate headlines um, within weeks or months or even years. Um, but those are the ones that really inform the most um, impact and can ultimately um, be scaled um, and are truly valuable for long-term change, um, which is also, I think, as we talk about how do you really meaningfully make these um, partnerships um, uh, appealing to those within our own organizations is being able to really um, showcase that internally as well, that, um you know, there, there's value to being a long-term partner to, to building that trust with your um, your partners and, and knowing that not everything has a, a short-term return um, and really trying to take that longer-term view. So I think that applies in, in all sectors, um, and yet we often find ourselves <laughs> up against deadlines, be they convenings or press um, moments. Yeah, which sometimes accelerate for the better, but other in others yes, uh, slow exactly. up, down. Um, Marcy, um, what, what are you looking at from from the point of view of, of partnerships at Facebook um, in terms of some of the, your larger partners? What's important to you and uh, how you evaluate who you want to bring to the table? Yeah, I think I think a, a kind of readiness and willingness is is a lot of what we look for. I, I think. There are a lot of organizations that are eager to partner with us that we would be eager to partner with, but there are a few key traits that we really value in partners that help them help us have a deeper and more robust relationship. One, and I, I think we talked about this when we were chatting as, as a panel yesterday um, in preparation, but just like um, willingness to kind of move fast and iterate you know, we don't um, we don't want to spend the first nine months of our partnership working out the SOW and, you know, getting all the paperwork in place and really want to be able to try new things together, both take the risk together, but then fail quickly if that's where it's headed and, and try again. And um, 
a lot, especially for large international organizations, a lot of them, they just, they're just not designed to move that way. And so that can be a challenge for us. And so it's not to say that partners that move more slowly aren't valuable and valued. We do have them, but, um, you know, partners like UNICEF is a great example. CARE is another great example that are just able and willing um, to move at, at a similar pace that we do and to accept the pace of change at a company like Facebook, you know, a tech company like ours. Um, and then finding mutual things we want to achieve together. So for example, one thing we recently made a commitment a couple of years ago around data and how might we use privacy preserved data that we have, that we, that we generate um, to help some of these nonprofits solve problems, solve their problems, get that much closer to their mission. We, and so we need partners who are willing and able to work with data and and work with us on capacity building for their staff or wh whoever works there um, to be able to leverage the data and 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 then let us know is this useful in the ways that we think it is and then we can do more of it find ways to scale the effort um, and so you know we we need a partner that's willing to move and move quickly and have it go well or not go well and change course midway and not get too hung up on, you know, the paperwork. Yes. Uh, and I think, you know, being similarly jointly mission driven uh, and finding that sweet spot of alignment between the missions. Greg, help us demystify a little bit the engagement with InterMEC. And I, mean, I, I was going to ask for, for the multilateral development bank community, but I think, you know, kind of uh, not putting the weight of the world on your shoulders. Um, but for so many organizations that are engaging with multilateral development institutions, it seems sort of too big. And so, and I know you're in the process of developing different products, offers. It doesn't all need to come with multi million dollar public private you know, uh, investment vehicle. So what are some of the different ways for private sector to engage with IDB? I think at the IDB, we've been fortunate. I mean, most of my career at the IDB was actually spent in a part of the IDB called IDB Lab, which actually is designed specifically to do um, what Marcy was just saying, which is to iterate quickly, to, you know, have a higher tolerance for failure, to engage on, you know, kind of innovative pilots and to, on a number of different, you know, topics and so on entrepreneurship and you know I used to lead on environment topics there and actually part of the reason why we created the program I have now is to bring some of that spirit to the you know big bank um, around the topic of biodiversity um, and I think you see a lot more of that happening across multilaterals in general not every multilateral has a, a something like IDB lab I wish they all did um, so I think that's one great point of engagement for um, private sector, um, obviously, because that's the place where you're going to be able to try these quick, um, you know, pilots and, and iterative processes. Um, and I think it also is is one of the places that allows the bank to have different kinds of products, because I, as you said, um, I think, and it's, this is not to speak you know, on behalf of IDB, this is more a personal view, but in any large organization, you know, they say, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're the person who does loans, whenever a client comes to you or a partner comes to you, you say, well, I've got loans, let's figure out how I can use a loan for this. When actually, I think what we've seen shifting in the last several years across many organizations is to take a step back and look at the, what the client's problem is and then see if you, where in your institution you might have that product and try to make that link. And if you don't have that product, think about why not and could we actually do something quickly to try to meet the need of the client where they are. Um, and so, you know, that's on the more kind of meta level. But then in my daily work, that's actually very much the kind of work that we do because I'm trying to do innovation in a field, biodiversity and natural capital, that's relatively new, poorly understood, where the value cases, are, I think, are pretty clear but may not communicated very well and where we need to try a lot of different things quickly. And so we, maybe we need to do um, simple agreements for future equity or you know, um, venture capital or risk capital for entrepreneurs at one level. And then we need to also be working with microfinance organizations, but also working with national development banks to create funding lines for these businesses and also having a conversation with the large investors like BlackRock and Morova over here and create these kind of seamless financing threads that go from I have an idea to I, you know, I'm looking to raise 10, 20 million dollars for my business. And so I think as MDBs, 
fitting out, figuring out where you fit in that kind of maturity curve and then which part of the institution is the place you need to talk to can be very challenging. Um, I hope we see more and more of these kind of one-stop shop engagements where you have more people with roles like mine, where, you know, you want to talk about biodiversity, talk to Greg. And if I'm not the person you need to work on this with, I'll at least introduce you to the people that you need to be. Um, Vijay, any comments from you just uh, in light with what Greg was describing in how from, I guess, the venture capital uh, standpoint, you like, I guess, how do you identify in sort of the right, um, I guess, the, across this value chain and maturity curve, like the right organizations and where you plug in um, to, to create that impact? Yeah, I think venture capital is at a very unique place right now because there's obviously a lot of liquidity in the world and there's a lot of money. But if you look closely at the data last year, there was a lot of capital going to very late stage, essentially pre-IPO, or I guess now it's fashionable to say pre-SPAC uh, companies. And what's happening at the earlier stage? Well, there's, um, there's still a lot of work to be done in a few critical areas. So uh, believe it or not, last year uh, there were... Um, there was less, not more, money directed to uh, towards uh, women founders, which is already like uh, low, uh, and, and like you know, it's, it stands at about um, you know nine percent, uh, let's say, of uh, of, of all uh, VC dollars. So, like the there, there's a lot more work to be done, and so uh, folks that are um, understanding of uh, a the, the issues that are behind the the headlines. And then want to dig deep in, into uh, exploring uh, something like that, and where uh, this can be additive, um, you know, capital. I don't want to say impact because we're not uh, impact investors, uh, but we, we do like care about uh, doing things that have uh, purpose attached to them and are, are aligned to our, our mission. And so that's where I think uh, matching values uh, has uh, a, a big part uh, to do with like what we see as uh, the right kind of relationship that we want to build. So um, even though we don't formally have a government representative, Courtney, I'm going to totally call on you wearing your uh, both your campaign hats and working um, during the, the Obama-Biden administration. In bringing the government perspective, maybe the elephant in the room, and how um, perhaps government more broadly, but I think this administration in particular, are looking at partnership in, partnerships and accelerating you know, so many of those critical issues from uh, mental health to the racial equality agenda to, you know, clim climate, we talked quite a bit about. But curious for your perspective and, again, the administration's uh, approach to, to partnerships, especially the private sector. Sure. Um, and I think um, it was interesting since we talked about this a little bit. Um, it's, I know, um, it, it's hard to look at some of the outreach work that the administration is doing and not see, you know, the multi-stakeholder approach um, clearly underway. And if you look at, um, you know, all of the vast COVID um, outreach um, that's being done, you know, there's no way that we could get to, um, you know, education around the need for vaccines and, you know, uh, mental health, racial equity. Um, we need, you know, everyone at the table for these intractable issues. And, you know, as I think um, Marcy has made clear and others, you know, corporations do want to do, um, be a part of solving these issues. And, um, you know, within the government, there's so many different offices. I think the Office of Public Engagement um, is a critical component of the White House work on all of these topics. Within the State Department, there's a number of um, and have been, you know, public-private partnerships that really are driving change. Um, I think there's so many examples within um, that are already aggressively making change right now. One of my favorites is the um, shots in the shop effort, which I think gives a good sense of um, how, you know, um, we're trying, how the administration is trying to get, um, it's, you know, both academic, the University of Maryland, um, a whole host of um, black owned barber shops um, and will be providing both educational resources and vaccinations throughout the month of June. Um, you've seen how companies like Lyft and Uber have 
um, come to the forefront to, to provide free rides to vaccinations. We have um, healthcare and childcare providers from kinder care to Bright Horizons providing coverage for parents who may need that um, time to go get their vaccines. And even now the vice president, um, Vice President Harris is on her first foreign trip. Um, obviously, so many issues around the border, but key to um, a lot of the work that she's doing is outreach to private sector companies um, working on a host of the issues you um, mentioned, whether it's Chobani, who's committed to bringing their food accelerator program to Guatemala um, in and I hope to, you know, increase economic empowerment, but also think about how um, the the supply chains can be impacted in a more sustainable way. And I think that entrepreneurship clearly is a theme um, that cuts across all of these areas as we've discussed. And so, um, you know, the, the engagement of the private sector in all of these issues, I think, has been um, clear. The, the first climate summit that was hosted and the commitments that were needed, the call to action was clearly to the private sector as well as others. And so um, I think there's a strong history of the private public engagement that goes you know, across administrations. But here we're seeing, you know, a real, I think, more of creativity and more engagement around how do you reach people where they are? It's not just about a corporate donation. It's about truly um, helping to impact behavioral change, helping to really um, have a more transformational partnership that can help uh, across all of the different issues that you mentioned. And this is so important because so often there is this preconceived perception of private sector as just a funder and uh, discounting for the supply chain reach, the ability to to really drive broader um, change. I think that you know it's really important to, to raise awareness of that. Uh, we're almost at time, but I want to super quickly touch on the data and the measurement piece. And Marcy, to you and to Greg, perhaps, how do you evaluate success and partnerships that work and, do and don't and how do you, you know you I think by moving quickly you perhaps know it sooner than, than later so what's what, what role does da data play in measurement in all of this so Marcy perhaps with you first and then with Greg yeah I mean we have a lot of ways that we measure on platform so I think and we tend to um we kind of fall back on that, those kinds of metrics. So if we're helping WHO run a fundraiser or we're doing a behavioral change campaign on platform, how many people do we re reach? What is the brand lift? Um, those kind of metrics. You know, one thing that we think a lot about and to be honest, have not really landed on is how do we tie that work to real world impact? How do you go from you know, measuring the brand lift of a particular messaging campaign to how many people change their minds about a particular, you know, getting vaccinated or how many people actually used our vaccine finder to figure out where the vaccine, um, where they can go make an appointment and then actually made the appointment and then actually showed up. So I think one of the things we have a harder time with and are really trying to think about is how do we measure real world impact of the partnerships that we have? Some of that is relying on partners and their measurement and then letting us know um, and then how much of what they are measuring can is actually attributable to our work together. We, we, we really haven't nailed that. And I think we, we're so accustomed to thinking at scale at Facebook and our numbers are, you know, we reach this many billions of people or, you know, millions of people took this action. Um, and but then really trying to understand what was the impact on an actual life um, is something, you know, we haven't unlocked yet. So open to ideas. <laughs> yeah, we're almost at a minute. So Greg, any super quick sound? Yeah, I'll be really brief. I mean, so our mission is improving lives. And so we have a corporate results framework and every project will have, you know, a set of corporate results around that goal, depending on what the project is. And so we'll use that to measure whether or not the project has, you know, basically delivered what it's supposed to deliver. I think what Marcy said about then dividing that attribution to how much was related to the partnership can be much more complicated. Sometimes we've done that through, uh, you know, blind trials and those kinds of different 
um, impact evaluations, but that's not for every project, obviously, and I will stop there. Great. Uh, we have one minute. So I want a soundbite from each of you. I mean, there's been so much talk about sort of the pandemic um, um, in, impatience and, and negativity, but what are you most optimistic about from where you sit uh, in your organizations about the year uh, ahead? Vijay, perhaps starting with you. Sure. Well, you know, uh, in, in VC, we're professional optimists. Uh, and so uh, I, I think uh, as, as we imagine the future, uh, what this pandemic is doing is it's taking healthcare and education to follow in the footsteps of media and retail and, and other things and uh, taking things from the physical uh, to the to the um, digital world. Uh, and I, I think as these things move into the cloud with collaboration and partnerships with other uh, institutions, uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll see our, our world uh, transformed. Courtney? Um, I do think people are seeking human connection um, after, especially um, at this stage, and I think people's eyes have been opened to the need um, for that connection and thinking about um, the inequities that existed before, but now 